management of the difficult airway, preparing the patient for awake intubation. With Dr. Elizabeth C. Beringer, Assistant Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care, Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and Dr. Irene P. Osborne, Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology and Director, Neuroanesthesia, New York University Medical Center, New York City. Sponsored under an educational grant from Astra USA. In 1993, the ASA Difficult Airway Task Force published an algorithm for management of the difficult airway. Awake intubation is the cornerstone of that algorithm. With proper organization and practice, awake intubation can be readily incorporated into routine airway management. Our goal in this video is to review with you preparation of the patient for awake intubation. This process includes identifying patients with a known or suspected difficult airway, organization of equipment, anesthetic agents, and monitoring, and the application of topical anesthetics to the upper airway. Let's begin by reviewing the reasons why awake intubation remains a uniquely safe method of airway access. The rationale for awake intubation involves a number of considerations. The natural airway is preserved. Spontaneous breathing is maintained. A patient who is awake and adequately anesthetized with topical agents may be easier to intubate. The patient can still protect their airway from aspiration. And the patient's neurologic symptoms may be monitored during manipulation of the airway. Other than patient refusal, lack of cooperation, or documented allergy to local anesthetics, there are virtually no contraindications to awake intubation. When a patient refuses awake intubation, this should be documented in the medical record. During the preoperative history and physical examination, there are a number of findings to indicate that a patient may have a difficult airway. These findings have a higher predictive value when a patient has more than one. Indications for awake intubation include prior history of difficult airway management, as well as findings on physical exam. These include protruding incisors, small mouth opening, a narrow mandible, micronathia, macroglossia, a short muscular or very long neck, or limited range of motion of the neck. Other findings suggesting the use of awake intubation include morbid obesity, congenital anomalies, pathology or malignancy of the upper airway, upper airway obstruction, or anticipated difficulty in mask ventilation. Trauma to the face, upper airway, or cervical spine may require awake intubation. Patients at severe risk of aspiration, respiratory failure, or significant hemodynamic instability may also benefit from awake intubation. Successful awake intubation depends to a large extent on the patient-physician relationship but primarily on the expertise of the endoscopist. To better ensure patient comfort and safety, there are four main components of premedication, including sedation, aspiration prophylaxis, and antisialagogues. If the nasal route is chosen, topical vasoconstriction and careful technique are essential to minimize trauma and bleeding. Patient monitoring should be in accordance with ASA guidelines and adjusted to the degree of the patient's underlying illness. The most important parameters to monitor include blood pressure, ECG, oxygen saturation, and respiratory rate. An important component in performing awake intubation is the availability of necessary equipment and supplies. A mobile, difficult airway cart allows awake intubation to be performed in various hospital settings, including the operating room, post-anesthesia care unit, intensive care unit, obstetrical suite, and the emergency room. Although organization of the cart should fit the needs and skills of the practitioner, various guidelines have been published suggesting its basic contents. A mobile, difficult airway cart may include the following surface workstation shown here with fiber optic bronchoscope and ancillary equipment drawer for drugs and auxiliary equipment such as nasal oral and intubating airways rigid laryngoscope blades 
endotracheal tubes and endotracheal tube guides, laryngeal mask airways, combat tubes, and specialized rigid blades and guides, retrograde intubation supplies, equipment for transtracheal jet ventilation, and surgical airway equipment. Additional equipment may be stored on the side, a portable oxygen tank, pulse oximetry unit, an exhaled CO2 detector may also be part of the cart. The safety and efficacy of topical anesthetics depends on dosage and proper administration. Resuscitative equipment, drugs, and oxygen must be readily available for immediate use. Let's take a moment to review some of the important guidelines and patient instructions involved prior to application of topical anesthetics to the airway. Patients should be NPO prior to elective awake intubation. In addition, they must be advised that topical anesthesia can impair swallowing and blunt reflexes that protect the lungs against aspiration. Subsequently, patients must remain NPO for at least 60 minutes following use of topical anesthetics in the oropharynx. Two of the most commonly used drugs for topical anesthesia are lidocaine, available in various preparations including 2% viscous solution, 5% ointment, 2% jelly, 4% solution, and 10% meter dose aerosol spray, and cocaine, available in either a 4% or 10% solution. Physicians should consult the prescribing information or standard drug references for specific contraindications to use of cocaine or lidocaine. Systemic manifestations of lidocaine anesthetic toxicity include lightheadedness, tinnitus, visual disturbances, muscular twitching, unconsciousness, convulsions, respiratory arrest, bradycardia, hypotension, and cardiac arrest. Signs and symptoms of cocaine overdose include tachycardia, arrhythmias, hypertension, fever, convulsions, respiratory arrest, and death. It should be used on intact mucosal surfaces to avoid erratic systemic absorption. In rare cases, toxic effects have been reported with doses as low as 20 milligrams. The total dose contributed by all formulations of topical anesthetics must be calculated prior to patient administration. Single dose tubes, metered sprays, or a graded medicine cup aid in calculating total drug dose. In order to avoid toxic manifestations, physicians should use the lowest effective dose. The sum total of the individual doses must not exceed the maximum recommended drug dosage. For topical lidocaine, the maximum recommended dose should not exceed 300 milligrams in an adult. Effective topical anesthesia of the airway is the key to successful awake intubation. Depending on the anticipated route of intubation, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, larynx, and trachea may require topical anesthesia. Now let's review the relevant anatomy and techniques used to apply topical anesthetics to the airway. Much of the sensory innervation to the nose is derived from two sources, the sphenopalatine ganglion and the anterior ethmoidal nerve. The sphenopalatine ganglion lies just beneath the mucosa on the caudad surface of the sphenoid sinus. It sends out multiple nasal branches that provide sensory innervation to the nasal septum and turbinates, including the greater palatine and lesser palatine nerves. The greater palatine nerve provides sensory innervation to the nasal turbinates and hard palate, while the lesser palatine nerves provide sensory innervation to the soft palate and uvula. The anterior ethmoidal nerve gives sensory innervation to the anterior portions of the nasal septum and lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Selection of the appropriate nostril entails visual inspection. The patient is asked to evaluate resistance to breathing while each nostril is occluded sequentially. The left nostril is preferable because the bevel of the nasal tracheal tube will then face the turbinate reducing the potential for trauma to the septum and subsequent bleeding. The anterior ethmoidal nerve is blocked by insertion of a long, sterile, cotton-tipped applicator dipped is blocked by insertion of a long, sterile, cotton-tipped applicator 
dipped in either 4% cocaine, 4% lidocaine, or 2% lidocaine jelly. The applicator is placed parallel to the dorsal surface of the nose until it meets the anterior surface of the cribiform plate. The applicator is held in place for about five minutes. Several approaches to the sphenopalatine ganglion have been described. The following approach takes advantage of the ganglion's shallow position beneath the nasal mucosa. A sterile cotton-tipped applicator dipped in either 4% cocaine, 4% lidocaine, or 2% lidocaine jelly is placed on the mucosal surface overlying the ganglion. The applicator is passed along the upper border of the middle turbinate at approximately a 45 degree angle to the hard palate and directed back and down until the upper posterior wall of the nasopharynx is reached. The applicator is then left in place for about five minutes. Following onset of effect, the applicators are removed. A nasal trumpet lubricated with 2% lidocaine jelly can be used to dilate the nasal cavity further. The size of the nasal trumpet approximates that of the endotracheal tube. The oropharynx is a commonly used route for awake intubation. Anesthesia can be provided by several methods. The somatic and visceral afferent fibers of the oropharynx are supplied by the vagus, facial, and glossopharyngeal nerves. The glossopharyngeal nerve supplies sensory innervation to the posterior third of the tongue, follicula, anterior surface of the epiglottis, posterior and lateral walls of the pharynx, and the tonsillar pillars. In the majority of patients, judicious premedication and adequate topical anesthesia of the oropharynx and larynx are sufficient to allow instrumentation of the airway. Techniques available for applying topical anesthetics include use of sprays, atomizers, and nebulizers. Oral sprays employing a long, flexible cannula make it possible to deliver topical anesthetic agents, here 10% lidocaine spray, to the oropharynx. Each spray delivers 10 milligrams of lidocaine with an onset time of two to five minutes. Adequacy of anesthesia can be tested by depressing the back of the tongue with a tongue blade. If a patient can tolerate this process, then the cannula can be inserted farther into the posterior region of the pharynx. Any residual agents should be suctioned to reduce GI absorption and provide a clear fiber optic field. Other techniques for delivery of topical anesthetics to the oropharynx include an atomizer containing 4% lidocaine or ultrasonic nebulization of a total of 4 ml of 4% lidocaine over a period of 10 to 20 minutes. The final step prior to instrumentation of the airway is to anesthetize the trachea. Translaryngeal injection of lidocaine provides topical anesthesia to the tracheal mucosa and the inferior aspect of the larynx. This allows the patient to tolerate the endotracheal tube without coughing or discomfort. The injection is best performed with the patient in the supine position with the neck hyperextended. Using aseptic technique, a right-handed person should stand on the left side of the patient. The cricothyroid membrane is palpated along with the upper border of the cricoid cartilage. A 3 ml syringe with a 22 gauge needle may be used first to raise a small skin wheel over the intended puncture site. The needle is angled at 45 degrees in the caudad direction. As the needle is passed through the cricothyroid membrane, resistance will be felt. At that point, aspiration for air verifies placement in the lumen of the airway. An adult patient is asked to take a deep breath and at the end of inspiration, 3 ml of 4% lidocaine is injected and the needle removed. This maneuver usually stimulates coughing, which helps to distribute the local anesthetic. Alternatively, a 20 gauge angiocatheter may be used. After the needle is removed, the syringe is carefully reattached and the aspiration test performed again. Complications of translaryngeal injection are rare, but may include bleeding, infection, subcutaneous emphysema, pneumomediastinum, pneumothorax, vocal cord damage, 
and esophageal perforation. Translaryngeal injection should be used with extreme caution in patients at risk for elevated ICP or IOP, as well as patients with severe cardiac disease, chronic cough, or those at risk for gastric aspiration. In cases of unstable cervical fracture, it is important to achieve adequate stabilization prior to injection. An alternative method to anesthetize the vocal cords and trachea is the spray-as-you-go technique. This technique, which is useful in patients at risk for aspiration of gastric contents, involves injecting local anesthetic through the suction port of a fiber optic bronchoscope. Since topical anesthetic is applied just prior to intubation, the patient is able to maintain airway reflexes for as long as possible. Two spray-as-you-go methods have been described for bronchoscopes with large suction channels. The first method involves passing an epidural catheter through the suction channel of an adult fiber optic bronchoscope. The catheter is cut short to the level of the distal end of the injection port to allow more accurate placement of local anesthetic. Under direct fiber optic vision, Targeted areas of the airway are sprayed with aliquots of 0.2 to 1.0 ml of 2% or 4% lidocaine. The physician waits 30 to 60 seconds before advancing to deeper structures and repeating the maneuver. The second method uses a triple stopcock attached to the proximal portion of the suction channel. Oxygen tubing is connected to the distal port of the stopcock and set to flow at 2 to 4 liters per minute. 2% or 4% lidocaine can then be injected through the remaining port of the stopcock and is nebulized by the flow of oxygen. Management of the difficult airway begins with identification of susceptible patients. Appropriate preparation produces a comfortable cooperative patient who will tolerate subsequent intubation with minimal pain or tissue trauma. Most importantly, successful awake intubation has the potential to reduce respiratory-related morbidity and mortality.